Hello and welcome to another Try Tutors video. Um, in today's video we're going to be looking at the second part of um, what I've termed as Pi's time as a castaway. We're going to be looking at the themes that are apparent in this section of the book. So please remember to read the novel first. This is an analysis of some of the key themes through some of the important quotes. So the first theme that is really, really significant is survival. And I did talk a little bit about this um, in the previous video, but one of the keys to Pi's survival is the fact that he balances reason with faith. So he is really religious, as we spoke about in the first video, in part one. And his faith in God, or in all the different religions that he believes in, really keeps him going because it allows him to stay sane in, sort of his, in his mental state. It gives him a routine in terms of his praying times, um, and it allows him to have hope. But at the same time, he would not have survived if he had just sat there and prayed. He also has reason to back up his survival. And so he needed reason in terms of figuring out how to train Richard Parker, right? Otherwise, he would have died very much sooner. Um, he also needed to figure out how to fish. He needed to figure out how to filter water. Um, he needed to figure out all these different things that involved reason and rationality to live. So in that very first part, we spoke about the two Mr. Kumars, and we can see that come through in his survival, is that he needs these two aspects in his life. He needs the faith and the hope, but he also needs reason and rationality and action. So notice that as we go through in terms of this theme of survival. This net would become one of my most precious possessions. So right at the beginning, this net comes comes onto or near the lifeboat. At the time, he doesn't recognize its importance, but um, in, in due course, when he is stuck there for so long, for 227 days, it becomes very useful. The idea of orange juice stirring was too much for my nerves to bear, so I did not consider it. So sometimes in order to survive, you just have to ignore certain things. The night passed, minute by slow minute. With, every, with the very first rays of light, it came alive in me, hope. As things emerged in outline and filled with colour, hope increased until it was like a song in my heart. Oh, what it was to bask in it. Things would work out yet. The worst was over. I had survived the night. Today I would be rescued. To think that, to string those words together in my mind, was itself a source of hope. Hope fed on hope. So remember that the first few days he survives because he thinks he's going to be rescued. And so once he gets through the first night, he just is, he's sort of like, clamors down and just tries to survive the night because he thinks he's going to be rescued the next day and then over time in the like over the next few days when he realizes that's not the case that's when he finally actually gets up and figures okay if i'm going to survive i have to find some water i have to find some food i have to get figure out this tiger situation so for the first few days he's very passive actually he's sitting there he's just trying to get through the time, past the time, because he thinks he's going to be saved. And that's important to his survival in those first few days, because he has this hope. But then later on, he has to change the gears in order to continue to survive. I raised my hands to the level of my chest, the weapons I had against the hyena. So he is so um, thirsty and so desperate that he has to like walk past the hyena. He can't just sit there and wait for someone to rescue him. He realizes this, so he raises his fist, which is sort of a humorous image to raise your fist against Sahina, but he's really, um, you know, to focus on his survival, he needs to go after water. Of hunger and thirst, thirst is the greater imperative. I did not grasp all these details and many more right away. They came to my notice with time and as a result of necessity. When some small thing, some detail, would transform itself and appear in my mind in a new light, how true it is that the necessity is the, that the, no, sorry, that necessity is the mother of invention. How very true. So this is when he actually sees the water and sees the food and he and all the supplies. He doesn't notice everything um, and what it's going to be used for. As, as he continues in his, in his survival journey, he uses different things at different times and he recognizes their value in different ways. So this really shows also Pi's sort of humanity. Remember, he's a 16-year-old boy. He's not trained in any sort of survival techniques or, you know, even ocean like navigating or anything like that so everything sort of comes to him he's sort of like doing this he's figuring it out as he goes as the lid opened it became a barrier that closed off 12 inches of open space between tarpaulin and bench through which richard parker could get to me after pushing aside the life jackets such a push would both warn me and help me fall backwards into the water with the life boy the delight of the manufactured good, the man-made device, the created thing. So as he opens the locker door, he realizes that the, it creates a barrier. So he's actually protected from Richard Parker. And he'll be warned if Richard Parker comes. 
Um, so he thinks of all these things as he's trying to get food and water. He thinks of all these potential dangers because he's not just surviving on the ocean, but he's also trying to survive from a tiger. And he finds these manufactured goods, these rations. Aching expectation has run its fruitful course. I had to drink now or I would die. And he calls water liquid life. Everything in me, right down to the pores of my skin, was expressing joy. So now he is, he's had water and he feels like a new person. My right hand started twitching. It reached and nearly touched the delicious flattened balls of parboiled rice in my imagination. It sank its fingers in the steaming hot flesh. It formed balls soaked with sauce. It brought, I, it brought it to my mouth. I chewed. Oh, it was exquisitely painful. This is when he's imagining the food that he would like to eat. Given the exceptional circumstances, the vegetarian part of me would simply pinch its nose and bear it. And so this is what I'm talking about with reason, right? Is that he realizes that he can't stay a vegetarian while on this lifeboat. He has to actually make some compromises in order to survive. So I had water rations to last me 124 days. I was so sorely in need of company and comfort that the attention brought to making each one of these mass-produced goods felt like a special attention paid to me. I repeatedly mumbled, thank you, thank you, thank you. So these are the early days of his survival where he's still getting accustomed to this isolation, this loneliness. After a thorough investigation, I made a complete list. So you see his rationality, his reason coming through. It's going to be responsible for his survival. I built a raft. It is for some, if for some reason it did not float, I was as good as dead. The fish scattered except for the sharks. So um, when he builds this raft because he realizes he can't stay on the lifeboats or the top line with Richard Parker, he needs to have somewhere else with which to view him. And he builds this raft, but he's no builder or anything. He doesn't have any experience. And he realizes that if it fails, then, you know, he's as good as dead. Also, the mention of the sharks just shows like he really can't catch a break from anything. Um, he's got sharks underneath them, a tiger on board. He's in the middle of nowhere. Heavy drops of fresh water plop loudly and wastefully into the sea. So that's just a note on perspective and perception. To him now, who's like has these water rations, the rain seems very wasteful. But to us, we wouldn't maybe consider it. We would just think, oh, it's raining. So just noting how different situations that you're in produce different sort of perceptions of the world. I had to tame him. It was at that moment that I realized this necessity. It was not a question of him or me, but of him and me. We were literally and figuratively in the same boat. We would live or we would die together. He might be killed in an accident or he could die shortly of natural causes, but it would be foolish to count on such an eventuality. More likely the worst would happen, the simple passage of time, in which his animal toughness would easily outlast my fum human frailty. Only if I tamed him could I possibly trick him into dying first, if we had to come to that sorry business. So this is when he makes a decision that he needs to train Richard Parker in order for them both to survive. I had to devise a training program for Richard Parker. I had to make him understand that I was top tiger and that his territory was limited to the floor of the boat, the stern bench and the side benches as far as the middle cross bench. So he does this because he knows that at some point he's going to have to leave the raft and come into the lifeboat. And when he does, he needs to make sure that Richard Parker understands where his place is and that he will not try and attack him. I had to start fishing very soon. It would not take long for Richard Parker to finish the animal carcasses. At the zoo, the adult lions and tigers ate on average 10 pounds of meat a day. I noticed that with the raft next to it, the lifeboat had changed direction. So it was no longer perpendicular to the waves, but broadside to them. And it was beginning to roll from side to side. That rolling was so unsettling for the stomach. What may seem like a detail to you was something which would save my life and which Richard Parker would come to regret. So these little details that he's noticing, as he says, they may not seem important, but they're actually really important because this allows him to train Richard Parker, allows him to make sure that he has a place in the lifeboat when he needs it and he is going to need it. And just notice how his survival also comes from the fact that he has something to do. He has Richard Parker to keep him focused and to sort of distract him from his trauma. Otherwise, he could be sitting there and, you know, completely just spiral out of control. Richard Parker gives him something to do. With some indefinably green and queasy in its tone. This is when he makes Richard Parker feel seasick, seasick to condition him to train him. A solar still is a device to produce fresh water from salt water. Work was slow but satisfying. It kept my mind busy. It took me a good part of the day to fix up the raft. There were many details to look after. The main rope tensed, with the other security rope, which I deliberately measured out longer, hung limply. It was a fine day. I decided to try my hand at fishing for the first time in my life. The sea moved in a lethargic way as if it was exhausted from the oncoming heat. I think that's significant because the sea is almost like a character in the sense that it changes. So in this moment it's lethargic, but later on we'll see how it the storm comes and it's completely, um, you know, the, the water goes 
crazy the storm makes the waves rise really high and so Pi is dealing he's not just like on a on a sort of nice and easy strait of water the sea the ocean is incredibly powerful and unpredictable I said against the mast I said against the mast I thought of our problem instantly these technological contraptions became as precious to me as cattle are to a farmer talking about how he gets water like his solar stills it occurred to me that with every passing day, the life was resembling a zoo enclosure more and more. Richard Parker had his sheltered area for sleeping and resting, his food stash, his lookout, and now his water hole. My clothes disintegrated, victims of the sun and salt. Salt water boils. Red, angry, disfiguring, were a leprosy of the high seas transmitted by the water that soaked me. And then he looks at the manual that has been left on the lifeboat, but a basic knowledge of seafaring was assumed by the author of the manual. I hadn't the faintest idea how to the night sky might serve as a road map. I had no means of controlling where I was going. And he figures out afterwards when he talks to people that the reason why he was sort of tending in that direction was because of the Pacific Equatorial counter current. But obviously, a 16 year old boy, he's, he didn't know that. He was unaware of that. The effort seemed out of proportion to the reward. So I just want you to note how in all these different quotes, it really just shows Pai's, you know, he doesn't just sit there and do nothing. He's really acting the whole time. He's trying to figure out how to survive, even though he has no sort of training or understanding of what he's doing. He's constantly trying, even though he, you, he it's, it would be very easy for him to feel helpless, right? He doesn't know how to navigate with the stars. He doesn't know what the currents are, but he tries to read this manual. He tries to figure it out. And so now he's going to try and fish as well. I stuck fingers into eyes, jammed hands into gills, crushed soft stomach with knees, bit tails with my teeth. I did whatever was necessary to hold a fish down until I could reach for the hatchet and chop its head off. With experience, with time and experience, I became a better hunter. I grew bolder and more agile. I developed an instinct, a feel for what to do. So remember, he abandons his vegetarianism. And I actually abandons a bit of pretty, pretty strong word. He almost like put, presses pause on it because he still lives by his values as much as he can. But... Um, he recognizes that he has to kill animals in order to survive. I wore those spots of shine and silver like tilaks, the marks of the marks of color that we Hindus wear on our foreheads as a symbol of the divine. So this is talking about when there was lots of fish and where there was moments of abundance. And just notice how, you know, when you are in survival mode, the small moments really do stand out and they really are powerful and so he says as you say as he says these are the good days they were rare so they didn't happen often but when they did he really basked in that i descended to a level of savagery i never imagined possible so in his quest to survive he has to give up a lot of his humanity and become more animalistic they provide a distraction what I saw was an upside down town, small, quiet and peaceful, whose citizens went about the sweet civility of angels. The sight was a welcome relief for my frayed nerves. So this is another form of distraction. He looks beneath the ocean beneath, um, and he sees this sort of city beneath it with all these animals and plants. Though I rested all the time, I rarely slept longer than an hour or so at a stretch, even at night. So thinking about that as well, just like counting how many things he has to contend with is insane. But that anxiety and that you know, you can never properly sleep when you're in a situation like that. It was apprehension and anxiety that roused me. On many nights, I was convinced I saw a light in the distance. Each light, each time I set off a flare. However, in time, I gave up entirely on being saved by a ship. And he realizes that it's only going to be his actions that are going to save him. No, humanity and its unreliable ways could not be counted on. From a single smell, a whole town arose. So this is also a matter, a matter of survival or a tool he uses for survival is, I think we're going to talk about later, the dream rag, which I briefly discussed in the last video as well. Like to have these sort of hallucinations or to think of your favorite food or your favorite moment. That's how he gets by. I drank the blood to the last drop. So there we have that sort of level of savagery again. Either I tamed him, made him see he was number one and he was number two, or I died the day I wanted to climb aboard the lifeboat during rough weather and he objected. I was continuously hungry. I thought about food obsessively. Whereas at first I gutted the fish and peeled their skin fastidiously, soon I no more than rinsed off their slimy slipperiness before biting into them, delighted to have such a treat between my teeth. By the end of my journey, I was eating everything a turtle had to offer. I was at the mercy of turtle meat for smiles. So remember that this is a really good example to prove his sort of descent into savagery or how he changes when he's on the, when he's on the sea and how... He, you know, as he says, he used to like fish very carefully and he used to clean the fish and now he just eats the fish because he's, he's become transformed. 
my body developed a revulsion for salt that I still experience to this day. So that shows the effect of, it's one of the examples of the effect of this venture and this ordeal on him in his later life. After just a few weeks, my body began to, to deteriorate. My feet and ankles started to swell and I was finding it very tiring to stand. There were many skies. There were many seas. I really, this, this, um, there's a, there's a wonderful, like, page of writing at the start of the chapter where it's talking about there were many skies there were many seas and it really just emphasizes how long he's on the water for and how you know day in and day out he only tells us like sort of the highlights or the low lights but there's a lot of like middle time that we don't really get to know there's lots of skies lots of seas lots of different days where he is struggling to survive and his survival is amplified by this you know because he's able to survive not just good times and bad times, but middle, medium times as well, which perhaps is even more difficult. Otherwise, I grew quite fond of sharks. They were co like commodity old friends who would never admit that they liked me, yet came round to see me all the time. At least the flesh was tasty and unfishy, and the crunchiness of cartilage was a welcome respite from so much soft food. I know my survival is hard to believe. When I think back, I can hardly believe it myself. Those plastic bags wouldn't have been more precious to me than had they contained gold, sapphires, rubies, and diamonds. I worried incessantly about them. My worst nightmare was that I would open the locker one morning and find that all three had spilled, or worse still, had split. So, this is all about how water is absolutely gold um, when he's on when he's on the lifeboat, when he's in the situation. And his deepest worry is that the water is going to spill, and that his he's not going to have any bags to refill with more water from the solar stills. It becomes his primary obsession and his, he gets paranoid about it, which is understandable. This is, once again, it shows us perception, right? And how at this moment in his life, in this situation, that water is so significant to him. The empty cans of water, which I now preciously kept. So remember right at the beginning when he finds the water, he like throws the can over, over the boat. Now he keeps the cans because he's so paranoid about getting water that he needs to make sure the cans are always full. The scarcity of fresh water was the single most constant source of anxiety and suffering throughout our journey. Because right at the beginning, he didn't know he was going to be on the boat for so long. He still thought he was going to be rescued. I noticed with a pinching of the heart that I ate like an animal, that this noisy, frantic, unchewing, wolfing down of mine was exactly the way Richard Parker ate. The bow vanished under the wa underwater. I was shocked and chilled and scared witless. But before we reached the next valley, I was half drowned. For the rest of the day and into the night, we went up and down, up and down, up and down, until terror became monotonous and was replaced by numbness and a complete giving up. I held onto the tarpaulin rope with one hand and the edge of the bow bench on with the other, while my body lay flat against the side bench. In this position, water pouring in, water pouring out, the tarpaulin beat me to a pulp. I was soaked and chilled, and I was bruised and cut by bones and turtle shells. The noise of the storm was constant, as was Richard Parker's snarling. I was sore all over and had a bad cut on my thigh. The wound was swollen and white. I was nearly too afraid to check the contents of the locker. I took out needle and thread and went about mending the tears, the tears in the tarpaulin. So um, this is talking about that really terrible night of of the storm and how um, that experience was. He goes back to the lifeboat, but they, he gets injured, and he's going to see now like he experiences loss as well, and it's really traumatizing. Um, for him another sort of just a very like particular example you could use in an essay to show his struggle is the night of the storm and you see how he tries to rebuild though he takes that needle and thread he he's like trying to um figure out what to do next he's always acting one hole bought me something i'd lost i considered it cradled in the palm of my hand was all that remained between me and death the last of the orange whistles so he loses a lot in this time and he loses the raft and we're going to talk about that in the next theme which is the theme of loss and what that means that the the loss of the raft is extremely heartbreaking for him and he has one last orange whistle and this is like really a crazy idea but this is literally between him and death because if he can't control Richard Parker and he's trained him with the whistle then Richard Parker has no reason to to obey him. I broke his neck by leveraging his head backwards one hand pushing up the beak the other holding the neck so we can see how much more savage he becomes. 10,000 trumpets and 20,000 drums could not have made as much noise as that bolt of lightning it was positively deafening. But the dream rag gave a special quality to my days. It must have been the way it restricted my air intake. I would be visited by the most extraordinary dreams, trances, visions, thoughts, sensations, remembrances, and time would be gobbled up. Would a twitch or gasp disturb me and the rag fell away, I'd come to full consciousness, delighted to find that time had slipped by. 
The dryness of the rag was part proof, but more than that was the feeling that things were different, that the present moment was different from the previous present moment. So the dream rag helps him to pass the time, he can sort of hallucinate a bit, think of other things and not his situation. Once again, another form of action. I put a message in a bottle. Japanese owned cargo ship Tsitsuma flying Panam flying Panamanian flag sank July 2nd, 1977 in Pacific, four days out of Manila. I'm in lifeboat. Piper tells my name. Have some food, some water, but Bengal tiger, serious problem. Please advise family, Winnipeg, Canada. Any help would be much appreciated. Thank you. I cork the bottle and cover the cork with a piece of plastic. I tie the passage to the neck of the bottle with nylon string, knotting it tightly. I launch the bottle into the water. Notice, yeah, he does still have a little bit of hope for his family being alive. Everything suffered. Everything became sun bleached and weather beaten. The lifeboat, the raft until it was lost, the tarpaulin, the stills, the rain catches, the plastic bags, the lines, the blankets and net all became worn, stretched, slack, cracked, dried, rotted, torn, discoloured. What was orange became whitish orange. What was smooth became rough. What was rough became smooth. What was sharp became blunt. What was whole became tattered. The sun took care of all the smells. So this is significant because this is a physical indication or physical manifestation of decay. And this is what's happening to Pi as well, is he's becoming weaker and weaker, just like all these objects around him are becoming weaker and weaker almost. My eyes started, my eyes started to ooze pus, then darkness came, blink as I might. At first it was right in front of me, a black spot at the centre of everything. It spread into a blot that reached the edges of my vision. All I saw of the sun the next morning was a crack of light at the top of my left eye, like a small window too high up. By noon, everything was pitch black. I clung to life. I was weakly frantic. The heat was infernal. I had so little strength I could no longer stand. My lips were hard and cracked. My mouth was dry and pasty, coated with a glutinous saliva, as foul to taste it as was to smell. My skin was burnt. My shriveled muscles ached. My limbs, especially my feet, were swollen and a constant sort of pain, source of pain. I was hungry and once again there was no food. As for water, Richard Parker was taking so much I was down to five spoonfuls a day. But this physical suffering was nothing compared to the moral torture I was about to endure. I would rate the day I went blind as the day of my extreme suffering began. I could not tell you when exactly in the journey it happened. Time, as I said before, became irrelevant. It must have been sometime between the 100th and 200th day. I was certain I would not last another one. So this is significant in terms of just showing us the extent of his survival. Like, you can think about survival in terms of the general thing of him surviving all this time on the sea, but also all these individual instances. Um, if you include these in your essay, it's going to show off that you really do understand and that you've read the text. Obviously, remember, you don't tell the story in a literature essay. Definitely watch my video on how to write a literature essay. Um, but you're not trying to tell the story, but rather you um, use them as examples. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to mention earlier, but I have a video on literature essays on how to write them and also a video on how to integrate quotes into a literature essay. So if you're watching this and taking down quotes that you know you want to use, definitely have a, have a watch of that video so you understand which quotes in particular you should be studying because obviously you can't study all of these quotes. When he finally arrives in Mexico, he describes the people. They came up to me with their hands covering their noses and mouths because you can just imagine being on, on the sea um, for 227 days, living like Pi was, he must have completely looked um, emaciated and terrible, but smelt really bad as well. Okay, moving on to the theme of loss. Um, obviously, Pi experiences a lot of loss. So here are just a couple of quotes that can... Um, show us the different kinds of loss he experiences. Mother, my tender guardian, angel of wisdom, where are you? And you, father, my loving worry wart, and you, Ravi, dazzling hero of my childhood. Every single thing I value in life has been destroyed. They were dead. I could no longer deny it. What a thing to acknowledge in your heart, to lose a brother is to lose someone with whom you can share the experience of growing old, who is supposed to bring you a sister-in-law and nieces and nephews, creatures to the people of the tree of life and give it new branches. To lose your father is to lose the one whose guidance and help you seek, who supports you like a tree trunk supports its branches. To lose your mother, well, that is like losing the sun above you, it is like losing, I'm sorry, I would rather not go on. I get teary-eyed every time I read that sentence because it really is such an ordeal that Pi goes through. And this is right at the beginning, before even his survival. Just think about the, the cargo ship sinking. He's already lost so much. I thought of my family, of how they were spared this terrible agony. On the day when I estimated it was my mother's birthday, I sang happy birthday to her out loud. And so this is the first really big instance of loss, is the loss of his family, of everything that he knew. And another instance of losses after the storm, when he loses the raft, because the raft, it was like a, a home to him. 
Yes, it was it was in a symbol of his accomplishment. He was able to build the raft himself to keep himself alive. Um, it was sort of a safe space for him and it kept him alive for so long. There was all this um, marine life that had grown around it. And with the storm, when it vanishes, he feels this in intense sense of loss. My little marine town had vanished. The loss of the raft was perhaps not fatal to my body, but it felt fatal to my spirits. So whenever we analyze a text, we usually talk about the theme of fate and versus free will. So I think there's certain elements of fate and luck that come into Pi's story, and then a lot of free will as well. I always tend to lean towards free will, uh, but we do have to acknowledge fate. So some luck that he, in, that he experiences that allows him to survive. It was a miracle I didn't hurt myself. So when he actually first gets into lifeboat, he's thrown overboard. Um, it's a miracle he didn't break his leg or anything. If there hadn't been a life boy, I wouldn't have lasted a minute. If it weren't for the Sahina, the sailor was, sailors wouldn't have thrown me into the lifeboat. So, I mean, that's all pretty lucky stuff, if you think about it. The fact that he was even on the lifeboat. And then, lastly, when he is training Richard Parker and he gets thrown back into the, into the, into the sea, luckily there were no sharks, because there were lots of sharks throughout his ordeal. But luckily, in that moment, when he's pushed off the boat, um, there are no sharks and he is able to pull himself, pull, him, pull himself up and live. Faith and hope, this links to religion. And remember, we spoke about this is a really key part of his survival, is having faith and having hope. Vishnu, preserve me. Allah, protect me. Christ, save me. I was alone and orphaned in the middle of the Pacific, hanging on to an oar, an adult tiger in front of me, sharks beneath me, a storm raging above me. Had I considered my prospects in the light of reason, I surely would have given up and let go of the oar, hoping that I might drown before being eaten. But I don't recall that I had a single thought during those first few minutes of relative safety. I didn't even notice daybreak. I held onto the oar. I just held on. God only knows why. So once again, you can see there how it's this combination of reason and faith that allows him to survive. And in that particular moment, it was faith. If he had thought about this reasonably, he really would not have wanted to live or he would not have persevered. Once you save the world by taking the form of fish, now you have saved me by taking the form of a fish. Thank you, thank you. I practiced religious rituals that I adapted to my circumstances. They brought me comfort, that is certain. But it was hard. Oh, it was hard. Faith in God is an opening up, a letting go, a deep trust, a free act of love. But sometimes it was so hard to love. Sometimes my heart was sinking so fast with anger, desolation and weariness. I was afraid it would sink to the very bottom of the Pacific and I would not be able to lift it back up. So talking about the troubles of faith, and once again, I feel like this really shows Pi as a, as a real sort of human figure that we can connect to, because he does struggle. He undergoes struggle, even with his faith, right? Even though he's probably one of the most, like, you know, faith-obsessed people, he still he does struggle being in this position to believe in God, but he also says that his belief in God allows him to live. And in this way, I would remind myself of creation and of my place in it. God's ear didn't seem to be listening. Despair was like heavy blackness that let no light in or out. It was a hell beyond expression. I thank God it always passed. This is an outbreak of divinity. The lower you are, the higher your mind will want to soar. It was a natural that, bereft and desperate as I was, in the throes of unremitting suffering, I should turn to God. There's a really wonderful line, I'm not sure why I didn't include it here, I must have included it somewhere else, where he talks about how he understands his suffering within the Hindu religion and he puts his suffering into perspective so when he was feeling sort of overwhelmed by his suffering and feeling really pessimistic he then actually reframes his suffering as being just tiny in the scope of the entire universe and that completely reframes his perspective and allows him to see his suffering for what it is that it's finite that it will end and he's able to then sort of move on in a more optimistic manner so I mean it's a really powerful thing to be able to do and that's what faith and hope allows him to do. We then have free will, so Pi's actions and how that ensures his survival. Didn't I have the perfect circus ring, inescapably round? Wasn't this an ideal source of treats with which to condition him to obey? Whistle, I had all the time in the world. My panic was gone. My fear was dominated. Survival was at hand. The Pi Patel Indo-Canadian Trans-Pacific Floating Circus. So his entire, all of his actions, so we spoke about in survival, of how he rations the food in the water, how he trains Richard Parker, all of these show his free will and that pious survival is because of his actions that he is responsible for his for his success so we can see the combination of the fate and the free will but to me i always lean towards free will and you have wonderful examples to prove that another important theme is the suffering both physical and mental suffering 
that pie endures. I was not wounded in any part of my body, but I had never experienced such intense pain. So when he actually is, um, he realizes his fate and he is on the lifeboat, um, he is not physically wounded, but he realizes that he's lost. I mean, he doesn't realize the extent of what he's lost, but he's feeling a lot of suffering. It's just mental. It's not perhaps physical. Uh, he doesn't know where his family is. There's lots of uncertainty. He's worried. He's got all these animals on board. Different from the frozen anxiety of the first night and being a more conventional sort of suffering. So remember the first night of his ordeal, he thinks that he's going to be saved. So he's just sort of like trying to hunker down and get through it. But afterwards, it becomes a more conventional sort of suffering because he realizes there might not be any salvation. The broken down kind of consisting of weeping and sadness and spiritual pain and different from later ones in which I still had the strength to appreciate fully what I felt. It was a sight horrible to the eyes and killing to the spirit. This is when he sees the zebra um, being eaten from the inside out. And this is what's really significant is when he realizes his own suffering, he says, I, suff I saw my suffering for what it was, finite and significant and insignificant, which I think is such a powerful thing to be able to say about suffering that much. And this is how he sort of even goes on surviving is because he recognizes that his suffering is going to come to an end. And in the broader span of the universe, that is really insignificant. When we reached land, Mexico to be exact, I was so weak, I barely had the strength to be happy about it. We had great difficulty landing. I wept like a child. It was not because I was overcome at having survived my, my ordeal, though I was, nor was it the presence of my brothers and sisters, though that too was very moving. I was weeping because Richard Parker had left me so unceremoniously. So remember that even after you know, experiencing such a terrible ordeal, the ordeal itself is terrible, but the aftermath can also be terrible. And the fact that he's left without um, Richard Parker and Richard Parker doesn't actually say goodbye to him properly um, really, really haunts him. And then reason and rationality. So remember we said reason and rationality, faith and hope work together to ensure his survival. One terror at a time, Pacific before tiger. So he's thinking reasonably, he's thinking rationally. Okay, let me attack each of these separately. Fear and reason fought over the answer. There was not a shadow of doubt about the matter. To leave the lifeboat meant certain death. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you found this video helpful. Please remember to like the video and subscribe to the channel and I'll see you in the next one.